are you doing? So you're having a, a great PGCon Brazil? Yep. So yeah, it's 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 been amazing to to be on site again, right? So see so many so many new faces, so many old faces, people that you haven't seen for a long time. So it's really enjoyable. It's really it's really awesome to be here. Uh, today we're going to talk about crash disaster. So today we're not going to talk about nice things. Actually, in fact, today we try to crash things. We try to make things not work. So the idea of this talk is not to make things work, but not work. So that's not an excuse if it doesn't work, right? So I want to make the point since the beginning. If it doesn't work, it's planned, right? So it's planned. Uh, yeah. Uh, before we start, I really want to do a huge thanks for those amazing guys, this crew here. So I want to name name them. This is Marcelo Altman. He's one of our developers for the core of MySQL database. So we have Leonardo here. He's in the support of, of Precona. He does a great, great job. He starts working with Postgres now. So uh, Fernando, the guy with the camera there, behind that, say hi, Nando. So he uh, works in our consulting team. See, he knows a lot about a lot of different databases. So he's also a great, uh, great guy. This last one here is Agustin. He delivered a talk yesterday. Uh, he also works for support. So he's a senior support uh, engineer at Percona. And we wouldn't be here if it was not the fault that they did. So we came all the way driving here from Joyville. And you see, we, we, we didn't have that much space, right? So that was enjoyable. So a, a huge, huge thanks for this amazing crew. Uh, I am Charlie Batista. I'm the tech lead, the Postgres tech lead at Percona. Uh, I've been working with uh, database and especially Postgres for not that long, right? like 20, 22 years now. So I worked before with Oracle, DBQ, Sybase. Then I started working with Postgres on the version 7.5. It was not great, I should say. So we had a lot of problems that the, that the project we had. Had a lot of crashes, the thing we're going to talk about today. We didn't have amazing backups, which is the top. And we'll see why that was so problematic, why that was, we, we had so many problems, right? So the talk today is going to be about, well, backups, right? So we are not fireworks, but we usually get into fires from time to time. And usually when that happens, we go there, okay, let's recover the backup. Oops, there is no backup. That's a big problem. So we're going to try to understand what are those things. People talk a lot about backup, AJ, disaster recovery, and all of those fancy names. What are them? Why are they so important? Why you need to care about them? Right? Also, what is this PITR? Fancy four letters that may save your life. Those four letters, sometimes they can save your life. And it's pretty easy to mess up with that. We'll see some stuff. And as remember, we're going to break uh, uh, the things here a couple of times. We'll try to see how we can get in real trouble with those things. And OK, yeah, how those things work. This is a fancy name for now it's time to, to do it live. And I hope the gods of live presentation, they are happy today. Because we did one yesterday, and that worked. You know, That's a bad sign. But that's fine. So, and by the end, we're going to talk about PG backrest. And if we go back for the beginning of the presentation, here, a div dive into Postgres backup using PG backrest. Uh, this is a catching one. We will not talk much really about PG backrest because there's not much to talk. It's an amazing tool. It's really, really simple to use. So we can talk about PG backrest for five minutes. So then we'll try to make things more interesting inside of the, the Postgres itself. We we'll try to understand how things work inside of the Postgres itself. Right? But let's start. Backup, recovery, disaster, those things. Well, I suppose we all know what, what backup is, right? 
I don't believe we need to, to do much. So backup is the process of creating a copy. It doesn't matter how we create that copy. But it doesn't matter how the copy is finished, the end of the copy. So for us to do a backup, for the backup to be successfully, we need some basis. We need, we need to follow some principles. First of all, it needs to be consistent. Right? Backup needs to be consistent. I've seen a lot of a lot of companies, they are using a file system copy to do backups. That's fine. That, that, that works. Uh, but we have a problem. Uh, all the database, not only Postgres, but all the database, they rely a, a lot on the kernel and the file system. So every time that you do an that we do an operation on the database, it first goes to memory, right? Everything goes to memory, and then when we do a commit, that thing that's in memory needs to go to the disk. It eventually will go to the disk, right? Uh, but before it really goes to the disk, uh, the database, in the case of Postgres, it just asks to the OS kernel. Could you, buddy, save this for me to the disk? That's current. OK. And it returns immediately. It's a good thing because it makes things faster. But it's a bad thing because it doesn't really save those files into the disk. And for some operations, Postgres try to force the kernel to save, to be fully consistent. For example, the wall files and the redo logs and those things. Postgres try to force the file. And it does with the fsync instruction. And from time to time ago, I got a case that the customers is complaining, look, look, our database is too slow. We cannot insert too fast. It's really, really slow. And I've seen in this amazing blog post, they asked us to disable the fsync on the postgresql.conf. Now our database is running really fast, but looks like we have some sort of corruption. So there are trade-offs. We cannot have everything that we want. So if one improves performance, you can make trade performance for security, for example. Is your data important? How important is your data? Is that more important to wait for a few seconds to save the data? Or you really need that few seconds, and if you just crash your database, it's fine. Like you know, it's just data. Who cares about data, right? Nobody cares. So, and when they get to the situation, they realize, wow, ah, yeah, now we need a backup, right? Now we need a backup. And well, remember that uh, I said the things in memory. Well, if you don't have a, a procedure to make sure that the data is fully on disk. When you do a file system copy, what happens? You're going to miss bytes. All of those things that were in memory that were supposed to be F-synced, they're not in the file system. Then what's the point of having backups? They're inconsistent. In a lot of cases, you cannot just recover the backup anymore. You have all the files you put there. That looks awesome. You do, you know, they full of bytes, and we're going to start the database. Bam! The database doesn't start. Oh, we're expecting to have this data on this block here, and actually have another data. All the block is empty or whatever. So we got a corruption, right? So when we do a backup, we need to make sure that it's consistent. So for Postgres, it has the PG base backup instruction that help us to do those things. And it's amazing. You just run PG base backup. We're gonna we're gonna do it here. We're gonna run the PG base backup. Uh, and it it's amazing. It copies everything. Uh, actually, before it starts copying everything, it's we wait for a checkpoint. That's another interesting thing. What is a checkpoint? Anybody? I know some guys here know, like for example, Raul knows what's a checkpoint. Right, Raul? What is a checkpoint? I can translate. 
<laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> so when you do a checkpoint, guys, we're forcing, the database is forcing that is being, try to force what's being memory that's uh, not, let's, let's get a, a step back. So we have two steps. What's in memory, we need to flush to the disk, right? So, but what happens when you're writing from memory to the disk is something if the, you lose power, electricity. You may end up with data, half of data on the disk, right? So we don't, we don't like half of data because it is inconsistency. The database cannot work with half data. Either you have full data or you don't have data. So the database has a mechanism to prevent the half data to happen. So the database uses some uh, files. There are sequential files, because a lot faster to write with sequential files, that we call wall files, or binary files, or there are many different of, uh, of naming that we do. So what the database does is, when we do an insert or an update, so of course it will change in memory, and immediately it's going to send to the disk. So we create that file. So we have the whole sequence of files. It's always write sequentially. So when it creates the file, let's say we have a 16 megabytes of file. It creates a whole file with 16 megabytes full of zeros because it wants to have the whole file in sequence because it's a lot faster. And then when we're saving, it will start filling those data what we save. But it doesn't go to the tables. It, it doesn't go to the tables. And the commit will only return back when the file system says, look, remember that f-sync that you asked me to do? Now you're good. Now you're good. So this in the disk, but still not in the tables, right? So when we do a checkpoint, it needs to go to those files there and then copy to the tables. So if we have a lot of all files that's not been checkpointed yet, what it does, it costs all those things for the table files. That's why checkpoint is so expensive, because there are only disk operations, copy from one place to another place. And what happens is something ha is if the database crashes while it's copying those files, we still have, we still end up with half of files, right? Half of data on the data files, but we still have all those files that's been f-synced before to the disk. So when the database starts back, the cr crash recovery process, we'll see, oh, the last LSN that was successfully flushed was well, this number. After this LSN number, everything is garbage. And it goes back to the wall files. Find that LSN and then redo. It rolls back whatever needs to be rolled back and then copy whatever is needed to be copied. That's how the database keeps consistent after we crash. This is a very powerful thing. Now you see what happens when you disable the F-Sync, right? So you end up with half data in both of files. So in some circumstances, it's not possible to recover the database. It's not possible to start up the database because the corruption is so huge that the database is not able to fully correct or fully fix the, the, the problem. So now we know why backups are important, and now we know why we need consistent backups. Let's move on. So we have this AJ disaster recovery, probably in the next one. So high availability. What is high availability? Everybody talks about, about high availability. Yeah, we need one to be high available. We don't want to lose a second of the, we, we, you know, our application needs high availability. What is high availability? What, is, what does that mean? Well, if you go for the Google, we'll see a lot of, a lot of different uh, approaches and meanings for high availability. In simple words, to be highly available means you'll always be able to access your database. You can be high available in write and read mode. You can be high available on read mode only. Depends on the process. So high availability is complex. And usually, high availability means to lose performance. Because to be high available, we usually need this to be in different data centers. Because, oh, OK, I have five nodes on the same data center. 
And then the data center, what happened to the data center? It gets on fire. Now we have fire availability. Everything is on fire, right? So, well, not a good thing. So to be highly available, we need at least to be in different data center. Doesn't, it's not enough to be in the different nodes, in the different servers. And I've seen people spinning up three nodes on the same machine. They have three different virtual machines, three different VMs on the same box, in the same physical box. Okay, now I'm high available. Fair enough. Fair enough. Right? We don't need to put fire on the data center. You know, you just need to do a shoot down. And like, let me explain the shoot down thing. I worked in, in a company before, and we were doing, our colleague was doing a process, uh, procedure during the weekend, and he was far from the data center. The data center was in a, in a building, and it was in the weekend. Then he called there, and the people from the security pick up the phone. The guy didn't ex uh, speak in English. The, 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 the guy from the, the data center. And then my colleague asked me, can you do a shoot down? And then the guy understood, shoot down. He explained where was the box. Hey, can you do the shoot down? The guy, yes. He went there and he did a shoot down. Shoot down in Portuguese means a huge kick. The guy went there and did a shoot down in the box. That's a true life story. <laughs> miscommunication issues. And miscommunication doesn't mean only the network miscommunication issues. So that box, that, that database that was high available in three different <laughs> virtual machines, what happened? Well, now it just lost high availability. Just because they shut down. So be careful when you want to shut down. And by the way, we, we also lost the, the motherboard. It was a huge shoot down. So when we are working with higher availability, we, we have those things. We need clustering. We need to be uh, distributed across uh, different sites. We need sometimes network load balancing. It's complex. It's really complex, right? So high availability is one step after the backups. But high availability doesn't solve the problems about backups. A lot of people, they say, no, no, we, we don't need backups. We have replicas. We have five replicas. Why do we need backups? Oh, that's awesome. What if your application has a bug and drop a database? It's going to drop a database in five replicas immediately. You know, bad things, they, they don't lag. Bad things, they replicate immediately. Man, that's amazing. You know? It's, it's, it's really amazing how those things happen, you know? Sometimes you take the whole week to, to get Replica, to remove the lag for a, just a couple of updates, but a drop table, a drop database is like magic, black magic. It goes, bah! Never fail. You know, replication lag are for the weeks on their circumstances. It's really amazing. So they don't solve the problem about backups. When we need to recover data that was mistakenly removed or something happened on this, the, uh, on this way, we really need backups, right? So and this is what is a disaster recovery plan. So when we have a really good disaster recovery plan, we need backups. We need availability. So we mix them together to have a disaster recovery plan because a disaster it's not if they happen, it's when they happen. They will. They will, eventually. And they will happen on the weekend when you are far from the data center and you need to call someone to do a shoot down. You know, Murphy's Law. That one is inevitable. It's unbelievable. So the disaster recovery or the recovery plan, it's a procedure or, or, or a plan on how, to, on how to try to prevent, of course, we, first of all, we try to prevent disaster. And later on, how to recover it when they happen. So we need to be able to mitigate problems. And when we go to the disaster recovery plan, we need to be clear on how much data we can lose. Because it's not if, but how much data we can lose. Remember that trade-off between performance 
and security, yeah, it also happens here. So on the disaster recovery plan, we need to put on how much data we can lose, on how fast also we can get the system back, because that's very important. Depends on your, on your product and your application. If you stay the whole day without the application, your, your company just bankrupt. Well, we don't want bankrupt, right? So those things are what we put on the disaster recovery plan. Those are the fancy names they have somewhere here. RPO, what is the, the point objective, how much data can, I can lose. The RTO, or how long I, we can take to recover the, the data. Because depending on those, on those information, on those points, is we will choose one solution or another solution. The solution we choose depends on those, those points. So if I need to recover, if I need my database to be back in max in two hours, I cannot have only full backups. We have a customer that they have 72 terabytes data on that database. How long that would take to recover if we have a disaster? Can you imagine if, and before, let's take a step back. How long that's going to take to do a backup? They wanted to do a full backup every day. It's not feasible. We still have some laws, you know, for that guy that physics, they, they push hard, especially that, that speed of flight thing, you know. I, I think it's bullshit. It's just, sorry for, excuse me for the word. I think it's, you know, it's, it's something that should not, should not care, right? but they still matter. We have hard physical limits that you cannot push over. So in that case, we need a strategy that works. For example, we can do a full backup on the weekends, and then we can do incremental backups. We can do differential backups. But we need to mitigate the problem. And those problems, they need to be here written. Because when the disaster happens, the CEOs, CTOs, all the C people, they will know, look, it will take this amount of time. Then call the emergency, tell the customer, put a website and tell them that we're going to be back in that much time. Now it's clear. Now we have a clear path of what to do in the case of a disaster happens. That's the importance of the disaster recovery plan, right? OK, but now the fancy letters. Point in time recovery. So what is a point in time recovery? Anybody? We have a spare microphone. Nobody? It's like uh, I, I need to recover my database until yesterday. OK, but what, what is the problem that solves? Uh, accidental deletes, for example. Record of deletes. Nice. Good Updates one. without where. <laughs> what is it with all <laughs> I've never seen that happen in my life. <laughs> Who is the DBA that said that never seen that in, my, in his life? It's lying. He's a liar. Right? I've never seen an happy date without a delete in my life. That, that, that happens. So remember that I said that replication is not able to solve all the problems, like the example that colleagues had here for a delete or a drop database or drop table. Whatever action that happened on the database is not a crash. Something that you need to get the data back. We need a point in time recovery. That's, it has the, the name. You pick a point in time, you recover a, a full backup, you recover a backup that has all the data before the problem, and then you tell the database, look database, I need to, you to read the wall files. Up to this point, when you get to this point, stop. Because I don't want you to apply the drop, the delete, the update, whatever, right? Then you are able to get the data back. So that's why it's point in time. On that point in time, the point in time we can specify 
a timestamp can be a day with very specific microseconds, if we have that information. It can be the transaction ID. You can ask, stop on this transaction ID. I don't want you to recover that transaction ID. That is a point in time recover. And this is the sort of problem that replication doesn't solve, for example. So this is the problem that when your C guy call you for, look, man, a hacker just accessed our database, you know, and he deleted all customers' data. Oops. And what is the problem about only having full backups? Remember, I said we need full backups. I said they are not enough. Well, the customer that wanted to do a full backup every day, they, didn't, they wanted to do a full backup every day because they didn't want to lose any data. Well, uh, they thought with the full backup every day, they could be able to recover the database at any time. But then that's not true. Let's say we have a database that is small enough that we can do a full backup every day at midnight. Takes one hour, right? So we start at midnight, takes one hour. We're safe. We have full backups every day. Now we're here, it's like almost 2 p.m. And somebody just do a drop table. Well, just go and recover the full backup. We have the full data up to midnight. From midnight up to, two, to now, we just lost the data. And that is when we need a point in time recovery. And that's when we say, keep your wall files. Keep them. Make sure when you, you have the stream, the files there, the archiving, it's working. A lot of companies, they test their backups every day, but they don't know if the wall stream are working. And then they, they need a point in time recovery they just realize they don't have the last one. Oops. Well, it's better to have something than nothing, right? But how much money that might cost for the business side? It's a lot of money. Usually a lot of money. And usually that last one is actually the one that you need. You don't need any of the other ones. You need that last one. Then, Marf again. Man, this guy work hard. You know? So a point in time recovery needs the wall file. You need to have them. You need, really need to have them. Right? Uh, so just saying that we, it allows us to go back in time and recover those things. And how does it work? How does it work? Now it's time to break things. Now is the funny time. So I have a database here. Let me change the configuration to share. Where is my mouse? I'm going to mirror. Apply. Yep, yeah, please keep changes. Here. Anybody can see it? I mean, everybody. OK. So I have a database working here. Actually, this is the last, not this one, but this one. Uh, that's the idea. I don't want you to see when it breaks, you know? <laughs> just a second. I'm just trying to. My com common D is not working. OK. So, is that enough? People in, in the back? All good? Cool. So, I have a database we're, uh, working here. So, it's working on Postgres 13. Uh, I just installed this database. There's nothing here. So, if I do a PSQL, of course, I don't have. I have no idea where the socket is. So, but I don't care about the socket. I can use TCP IP. And it says the database char doesn't exist. And it says the password is wrong. Let's change the password. Hmm. 
that what happens when you want to, to, to do a, a live demo, right? So do you know what you do? I always wanted to do this thing here. You go here, you get the PID, you do a Q-9 on the Postgres PID. Q-9. You know? Dash nine, dash nine, dash nine. And it's not on the, the connection PID. This is on the Postgres PID. Do you know what's the difference to do a Q-9 on the connection PID? You know what happens? That's bad, but it's not so bad. Do you know why? I'm, I'll wait for it when, sorry, why am I still connecting? Huh? What does that memory things mean? To explain all of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, see, that worked. It's because now I just started up another version. This database must should be empty. I'm gonna explain for the, the Q-9 thing. So we only have the, the test database. Of course, I need to tell which database I want to connect. So if I do a dash D here, we don't have any tables, right? So it's empty, I just, I just start up this database for, for this thing here. So the, the Q-9 thing, uh, every time that you open a connection to Postgres, it creates a process inside of the database. The database uh, uses the, the shared memory process method uh, or architecture, right? So there is a area in memory that's been shared for all those, those processes, including the nice, we call buffer pool, or I always forget the name in the, the, in the Postgres one. So yeah, the, the shared memory. So when you open a connection, we start doing things, select and insert, and so all those things, they share some memory in that space, right? When you do a Q-9, what happens is that process, that Q, might have caused some corruption in that memory, that shared memory space. So the Postgres, the database, it has a safe measure to say, whoops, I detected some sort of corruption here, so I'm gonna shoot down. It sends a shoot down process for all the other connections. It will try to finish the other uh, connections, wait them to finish, and then after that, it will restart itself. So to prevent corruption in memory. It will not happen if you do a Q-9 on the database process like I did here, because this is the process that will control those things, right? So, <clears throat> okay, we are back. Uh, I'm gonna create a table here, create table T1. Doesn't need to be a fancy table. Uh, a integer uh, primary key. I don't need to, but I always like to have a primary key. So insert into T1, select X from generate series one to 1,000. <clears throat> Obviously. Okay, I have 1,000 rows here, right? Select count from T1. I have 1,000 rows here. <clears throat> At this point, uh, if I do a backup of my database, my backup will have 1,000 rows, right? Let's do a backup here. I have, of, obviously, I have the script here for my PG base backup. And it was still using the, so I'm gonna run, use the tool here. The problem is my PG base backup is not on the path, so I do a app. PGSQL, I pick the version, I'm using the version 14, no SSL, PGBase, oops, PGBase backup, host, the port, username is not Postgres, it's me. So let's, before we go that, let's go through the options that we here. This is gonna do a full copy of my database. We have some options. It looks like it didn't run. 
Oh, there's another folder bin. Okay. So we have many different options. Uh, the important ones, I mean, the, it will not run without telling which is the PG data director. This is where you're gonna save, right? Where PG based backup gonna run thing. We can uh, specify the format. If you want a plain text that which is once the default, or if you want to compress the tar, the max rate. Sometimes you don't you don't want to saturate your database, so you can have you can. Specify if you want to, it to write a re, uh, the recovery conf file if you want to spin up a replica. So it will create the file for you to spin up the replica. And table space, uh, sometimes you have different table space mapping. Uh, you can also stream the wall in a different connections. So you can do things. And the compression, the level of compression. So there are many options here. Right, and the username, the password. Uh, you can specify if you want a checkpoint. Remember when I said in the beginning that we need the data to be consistent <clears throat> in disk. Yeah, you will try to do a checkpoint. So <clears throat> the PG base backup it solves uh, it does the automation of the backup process because how the backup process used it to be in older, older versions. We need to run a PG, a command inside of the database that was PG start backup. We we'll tell the database, look, I want to do a backup. It will, it would do the checkpoint, it will a label inside of the wall files and tell for look, everything up to this point is consistent written to the disk and on the table data, right? So it's consistent here. If you do a file system copy, you can, you, you can recover up to that point, at least up to that point, right? So the PG base backup does all of those things. And then it copies. We use it to run our sync, for example, to do, to do copies because they're faster. So it will copy everything or over the file system. It's a file system backup procedure, a copy, right? So let's run it here. Hope to work because we need at least APG a backup. So I'm asking to do a checkpoint fast, try to, to force a checkpoint and everything. Uh, let me double check that I have not this one. I have this folder here. I'm actually gonna be 14. Okay, this one I need to create. The last one I don't really need to create it again, but why not? Okay, just created a folder, and now we run the command. Yeah, I just miss an M. That always happened. Okay, <clears throat> well, my database is, is pretty, pretty small, right? So we have a backup here. Let's go to this folder. What, what do we have inside of this folder? So I suppose you guys, it's familiar, right? So this is the database. This is a, it's, it's a physical copy of the database, of the backups that, that we have a lot. That's what the PG base backup does, right? It does a physical copy and everything. So now we have a consistent backup of that 1,000 rows that we, I, I just created, right? So I can, for example, go to my database. And let me go to my database, PSQL. Okay, now we have a database test. And I can insert. Well, I could just use a default value there. One more thousand rows. So now we have 2,000 rows, right? So if something happens to my database now, if I crash my database now, am I able to do a point in time recovery? That's a good point. What <clears throat> I just installed this database, I just created, it didn't change anything. Do I have logs? 
we have an answer. So, why? Yeah, because you don't have archive, right? So that's the point we were talking before. Yes, we have logs here, and my database only have a thousand rows here. But we have a busy database. It happens after many days, so we might not have all the logs that we need for the point in time recovery. Remember, if we do a full backup on the weekends, and we need to do a point in time recovery on, I don't know, on Friday, probably some of your wall files will be recycled. And if you do not have archiving, that's it. You don't have the point in time recovery. You might, right? So for this case here, it's pretty easy. So let me do a select now. Okay, I have a date. And what I'm gonna do is drop table T1, because why not? It's my database. I like to do drop tables. I just did a Q-9, right? So what is a drop table? Okay, I just dropped the table here. <clears throat> so now we want to recover this database. So one thing that we can do, let's do it again. You know, I'm... Just a fancy way to do a Q-9. So I don't have my database anymore. I, ha I had a crash. The database crashed, and I need to recover that data, right? So we, we have the, the full backup. We actually we are in this folder. One thing that I'm going to do here, I'm going to do a copy from this PG-14 to PG-14-2. Copy doesn't exist. CP, it's better. I'm going to use the PG14 to start up my database. Why did I did a copy? Because I want later to do a PG based backup, and I don't want to mess up with the data. So for safety measures, always do those things on a copy of your database. So try to never do on your production database. And we're going to have, we'll see that we're going to have some difficulties here. One is the reconciliation of data. So now I don't have the table. I didn't do anything. But if my application kept reading, we might recreate that table. And then I have different versions of the, many different versions of the same table. Right? I have one version of the, the table that was the backup time that had 1,000 rows. I have the version of my database that might ha not have even the table because it was dropped. And I might have a third version of the database that after that backup, someone went there and create that table and the system start working, but the data is not reliable. So we have three different versions of these tables. And we basically can have three different timelines. When you start working with those process that's recovering or especially it, it's more common when we are working with replication. Remember back for the high availability, we have a primary, that primary dies and you promote another one replica as a primary. So that primary had a timeline. It has one, its lifespan that was working everything. When you promoted another replica, that replica will create a new timeline. So when you point all the replicas to that one, they also have timelines. They, they need to comply with those timelines at work. And if you do promote and promote, when we start doing those things as well, we're going to have different timelines, time spans. The problem is, if we start messing up with the timelines, we can end up in a, in, in a situation that 
we have uh, data in different timelines and different, then we need to do consolidation. Who is the one that's really the, that the replicas need to follow, right? So it's an important, important point that we need to mention. But for here, it's fine. I'm going to just spin up the, this node. And the data actually is here. It's just any start. Hmm, it's taking some time to start. One thing that you probably don't have here are logs. Oops. Var lib var log. I don't think it's been to going to the syslog. Yeah, I forgot to get the logs. So, what are you gonna do? Yeah, it did not start. Oh, actually did. Hmm, interesting. So, we have our database. It looks like that started, right? So, let me connect. <clears throat> we have our database back. Uh, I can select here, well, the wrong database. We didn't kill the thing, did we? The database is not working. We have the data. Oh, that's, that's the right one. Anyways, it's, let me go here. Replica. Timeout. Let's put our logs. Log destination, okay. We want S to the R. We want the collector on. And we want the directory to be this one. Okay, now we have logs. The format, for now, we don't care. The database is stopped. This is the right folder. And what we can do, now we can go to the logs. I didn't create. It is indeed the right, the right folder. but we don't have the table there. What happened? Why we don't have the table there? Did we do the backup before or after we create the table? It was after, right? And the thing is, we don't have the logs yet. Let me stop. Oh, 
Okay. Our data is, in, is inconsistent. No, this is fine. It's not inconsistent. All right. Where is... Uh, we have a problem here, look. Oh, 10 minutes. See, this is a problem when we crash our database. But was not it supposed to, to be flushed to the disk? My question is, if I get the original database, remember we have the wall files on the original database. If I get to, if I get this guy here, do you think I'm still able to, to point? Let's try to do. So one thing we're trying to hear is we're in the hope that this happened. <clears throat> before we did the draw, right? So, and in this case, I will copy all the wall files. I will use this, this, I'm still gonna use this, this backup here. I will point, I'll copy the wall files here, and I will try to do a point in time recovery. And I just realized that the select now, oh, we still have here. Because we need this here. This is an information that we need. So I want to tell up to when I want to do, I want, when the database stops, right? So I want the database to stop here. Then let's do that. I will create the, uh, <clears throat> I change my postgresql.com file. It changed on, in one version before <clears throat> we use it to have a recovery.com uh, recovery file. And if I remember correctly, changing on version 12 to 13 or 11 to 12, I don't really re remember now. But now we don't have that file anymore. We, we use the configuration like postgresql.conf.alto to put the, what you want to the database to recover. So I'm on the backup folder and I'm gonna edit this file. So, Important thing, it's being overwritten by the system command, right? Never edit this file. But for now, I'm not going to send any system command. We can do on postgres.conf, or you can create another file and do an include inside of postgres.conf. That's usually probably the better alternative. So what are you gonna do here? Let me just copy this, oops. I want to shoot down. Not promoting. <clears throat> so we're gonna copy the wall files from the folder that's been saved before. So the original folder of the database is this one. Let's see if we have wall files there. Pg wall. We do. We have three files. And and then I'm gonna tell to the database when I want the database to stops. This is the point where the database is gonna stop. 
It will stop at this point here. We did this select before the drop, right? So this happens before we run the drop. We don't want to include the drop table, right? Uh, the target, I want it to be inclusive now. This was, <clears throat> we don't, I don't want to include this, this point inside of the recovery point, so it's okay. And the action, what I want it to do with the database when finished. So <clears throat> we can promote the database if, if, if it was a replica, we can do just a shoot down, we can just wait. And if not mistaken, there are four actions that you can ask the database to do. In my case now, I'm gonna just ask for a shoot down. Right, uh, and then I want to start the database. Is this right folder? Data backups, yeah, this is the right folder. Data backup PG fourteen. Well, that was pretty fast. Could not start. Yeah. It did. And we have the hope that it is in the log because it asked to check the logs. Oh, the PID file already exists. Hmm. Where is this PID file? Postmaster.pid. It was supposed to create here. So it cannot write my PID. It's still using the old data. <laughs> ah, we found the problem. <laughs> the data directory of the PostgreSQL.com is still pointing to the old one. So, what we do, I will just comment here because it will get the good catch, Breno. That was a You save the presentation. Okay, now we have a problem that's expected. But at least now we should have Something different. Not this one. Ah, uh, now we have permissions problem. That's it. That's easy. Seven zero zero, what's the one? Seven five zero. Seven zero zero.
Now we have a file. We have one minute to do this. Okay, a few seconds and restart to try. Oh, we already have a process. One minute, one minute, and we have the database in one minute. So we have our database now. So what we're gonna do, very quickly because we have concurrency problems here, so let's do a check what was done here, right? This is a log file. Okay, so what happens, what the database did? It did a recovery. It found a consistent point here, and then it did a try to do a recovery here. And the database is ready to accept connections, right? So, the problem, the first problem we had, we had a configuration problem. The, the database uh, folder was to the, uh, point to the wrong database, so we had that configuration problem. Then we have permissions problem. Remember, the database will try always to keep things secure, so do not give too much permissions. When you use the PGBase backup, it will just give the default uh, permissions, 750. It, it needs 700, right? So we fix it. We, we pointed to where we wanted it to, to start. And that's the point and it started. And, okay. And if you, just one minute. I promise it's just one minute. And let me just uh, change the postgresconf.auto.conf here. We don't want to do it anymore. And I just realized it. Let's start. Start. And before I start, uh, before I say anything, if you select this table here, how many uh, rows do you expect to see? Why? So expect to see 2,000, right? We'll see 1,000. Because we didn't create the signal dot recovery process. We only told the database, you might want to recover, but you didn't want to recover. And now I cannot use this to recover anymore. And that's why you created the backup. We didn't ask for it to execute because you need to signal to recover. If you do not create this, the, the recovery.signal file not signaling to the database recover. We can just leave that configuration there. But if you do not signal the database recover, so this is might want to recover in the future or not, but you need to tell the database. You want to, to go to recovery mode. You need to signal the database. Yeah. Yeah. I think 12, right? Yeah. So that's why we copied that table, because we wanted to make sure in the next attempt we would have the signal. But we do later, because now we don't want to. I said one minute, and I'll keep my promise. <laughs> no, no, I said that, that last one, you know, that was the consistent one. <laughs> so thanks, guys. Here's uh, as Sorry for it's not being fully worked today. So we'll be out there. We can finish the process and show what was supposed to be here. And thanks a lot for attendance.